Well, praise the Lamb of God again, beloved. We had some technical difficulties this morning, but we're back. We've resumed, and we're going to go through our book of Romans today. I'm Dr. Lyle Lee with Word of God Ministry. We've been studying Romans from chapter 1. Today we're into chapter number 8. We managed to finish the first 15 verses of this chapter. Now we're going to continue in chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now this is an unconditional promise that all people that are born again, they become a child of God. That's an unconditional promise. In verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now, I am an heir of God, as are all children of God, and a joint heir with Christ. So what's the difference? As an heir of God, I have to be an inheritor. I am inheriting that which God has as a joint heir with Christ. I'm actually inheriting what Jesus owns. Now, all of us together collectively inherit all of what Christ owns. We don't get 5% and 2% and 7 and 20. It's not like that. We all inherit 100% of what Christ owns as a joint heir. <clears throat> now, you will notice here that there is a condition placed here for a blessing. This is called conditional promises. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So we are heirs of God, join heirs of Christ. But then here comes a conditional promise. If so be that we suffer with Christ. See, this is how a Christian receives the salvation of their soul and body. By suffering. So this is one way to obtain glory. Now in verse number 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So the sufferings that we are going through right now are not worthy to be compared when you look at the glory that you're going to receive, then you'll see that your sufferings, in order to obtain the conditional blessing of getting glory, the glory was far greater than the suffering. The suffering was very minor, and the reward was very huge. So it's not like you suffered for a day or a year and you thought that suffering was very lengthy and very hard, but compared to eternal glory, it was very small. In verse 19, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, if you understood what Paul said here in Romans 8, 14, Sorry, Romans 8, 19, verse 19, that the creature, which means my human body, my human body is called the creature, and it's waiting to become a son of God. So that tells you right now, no child of God can attain to becoming a son of God in their body. Now, let me explain that. The body is not saved. The body is unregenerated. 
it is not born again. So therefore, the body cannot be a child of God, and it cannot grow into a son of God. Only the human spirit today in all Christians can become a son of God. And that's when the Christian matures, grows up, and they're led by the Spirit of God, and they become sons of God. And we studied that last week in Romans 8. 14. But right now, my body is not a son of God, nor can it be, nor will it be as long as I'm inside of it. Unless the Lord Jesus were to come right now, and that's not going to happen. But the point here is that no Christian can be a son of God in their body. The manifestation of the sons of God are at the second coming of Christ. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up, change in a moment the twinkling of an eye, and then mortals shall put on immortality. The corruptible shall put on incorruption. So at that time, you can become a son of God in your human body, but not before that. Now in verse number 20, for the creature was made subject to vanity. I'm sure most of us have acknowledged that, that we are very vain in our unsaved body. Not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Now he's saying that hope is given to every Christian. And hope is the salvation of the soul and body. That's what the hope is all about, the doctrine of hope. It's the salvation of the soul and body. Here in verse number 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now Paul's saying that this is going to happen that your body will be changed from being corruptible. But right now, it's corruptible. And no matter how much you serve the Lord, your body is going to remain corruptible. You cannot fast it away, pray it away. That's never going to happen. Until you give up the ghost, that body is going to remain corruptible. Unless you go through the tribulation and great tribulation, and you're alive at the end of the great tribulation when the second coming of Christ happens, according to Matthew 24, verse 29 and 30. And at the end of the great tribulation, at that time, the corruptible will put on incorruption. The body will become saved. But again, let me make this very clear. These are conditional promises, and they're not a surety or a guarantee for any Christian. Just because you're a Christian, it doesn't mean your soul and body will be saved. Jesus said to Christians, you can gain the world and lose your soul. You can lose your body also, the salvation of your body. If you don't know what I'm talking about, read carefully Revelation 22, verse 15. Outside the final kingdom of God, after the white throne judgment, when all the devils are put into the lake of fire, when all the children of the devil are put into the lake of fire, on the earth are dogs. These dogs are Christians that did not get a glorified soul and body. Revelation 22, verse 15. It's worth reading. Now, in verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. So all Christians all around the world are groaning in pain. They want the mortal to be swallowed up by immortality. So in verse 23, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, 
even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Now that's very clear what Paul said, but in case you missed it, I'm going to reiterate. Now, we ourselves, so every Christian, Paul said, have become the first fruits of the Spirit. Now, the word first fruit means resurrected. So when I look at myself, spirit, soul, and body, what part of me is resurrected? And obviously, it's my heart, my spirit. Only my spirit is born again. Only my spirit is resurrected. Old things are passed away. Everything's made new in my spirit. And this is why my spirit is called first fruit. So my spirit is resurrected, the doctrine of first fruit. But now he goes on to say, we are groaning not in our spirit so much as our body, waiting for an adoption. Now I'm already adopted in my spirit in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5. I'm already adopted. But that's my spirit that's a child of God. My body is not a child of God. Far from that. And so my body wants adoption. And Paul called the adoption the redemption of the body. So when the body is redeemed, so it's going to be changed from mortal to immortality. But right now, it is definitely mortal, corruptible, and it is not a child of God. In verse number 24, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Now here, Paul is using the word hope as a doctrine for the salvation of the soul and body. And he's telling you, because you do not have salvation of the soul and body, you can hope for it. Because if you had it, you would not hope for something you already possessed. You can only hope for what you do not possess. And you do not possess being a child of God in your body or a son of God. And no Christian does. So we all are hoping for the salvation of our soul and body. Now, verse 25. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So this is the will of God that we would wait and that waiting for our salvation of the soul and body, that waiting can be described in many ways. It doesn't mean that I'm just going to sit in my house and let the years roll by until one day my soul and body gets glorified. That's not what he's saying. This waiting with patience actually means while you're serving the Lord, while you're doing good works, while you're being fruitful, while you're being discipled, while you're suffering, while you're going through from earth to glory. You do it with patience, and you're waiting for this adoption to happen, the redemption of your body. Verse number 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, Paul is saying that all Christians suffer infirmities, and you can say, yea and amen, you're among them. We go through our infirmities, but yet we don't know how to pray for our infirmities. 
So what happens? The Holy Spirit has to groan within us to help us to learn how to pray for our infirmities. Now, many times when I think of this verse, I think about praying in tongues so that my human spirit can join in oneness with the Spirit of God. And I can pray the will of God when I'm praying in tongues. And I can intercede for my own infirmities because I don't know what they are. Now in verse 27, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now the one that search out, searches out the heart, that's your human spirit, is searching out your spirit and you. Your human spirit searches you out. God's spirit can also search you out. But God's spirit, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, is searching God out. What God likes, what God hates, what's God's attributes, what's God's character. God's spirit is searching him out. And according to 1 Corinthians 2, the human spirit is searching out the likes and dislikes of a human being. So what Paul is saying here is similar to what he already wrote in 1 Corinthians 2. And he's making mention that the heart is searched out. Now, the Spirit of God can be a light within us also to search out the things that are within us. And it's the Spirit that is making intercession, the Holy Spirit. He's interceding for the saints according to the will of God. Now, the big question here, what is the will of God? That's a huge question. The understanding of the will of God today is found from Matthew to Revelation. That's the will of God today. It's bound up in the four categories of the gospel, the New Testament, the gospel of the kingdom, and the new covenant. That is the will of God. Now in verse 28, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now this is a conditional promise. Paul is saying that everything that you go through in life will work out for your good, but only if you meet the condition that you love God. Now, how is that condition understood? Well, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So this therefore states, if you're keeping the commandments of Christ, then you're loving God. And by loving God, no matter what you go through in life, it's going to work out for your good. So the good that you go through and the bad that you go through, the trials, the suffering, it's all working out for your good. But remember, you have to be meeting the condition that you're doing the commandments of God. Now, it also states here, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now, our calling is unconditional. We are called in Isaac, first of all. We didn't do it. God did it, gave it to us as an unconditional promise. So we are called in Isaac. And... What is the purpose we are called unto? Well, that's a huge subject because you're called to be a witness. You're called to cross bear. You're called to be a disciple. You're called to fruit bearing. 
It just goes on and on and on and on. The many aspects of your calling. What is it for? You're called to suffer for Christ. In verse number 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, from verse 29 to verse number 30, we're going to read heavily into the doctrine of predestination. But actually, it's going to interpret for us the doctrine. One of the damnable heresies that's written in the Strong's Concordance. Now, I love the Strong's Greek lexicon or inexhaustive concordance. They've done a great job in many cases, but here in the Strong's Concordance, they have perverted the word of God. They've done a very terrible job when dealing with the doctrine of predestination. They took one view and they called it predetermination. That is demonic. And where did this view come from? Well, it came out of the fourth century. And I suppose if we do a little bit of history, we would find out it was written by a Catholic priest. He interpreted predestination as predetermination. And then along came John Calvin in the 15th century, and he resurrected that doctrine that predestination is predetermination. And so that stayed like that in a lot of cases. So now the Strong's Concordance, instead of interpreting predestination, they just went along with this 500-year-old heresy that it's predetermination. Now, what does predetermination teach? Why am I calling it a heresy? Well, I'm going to explain why it's a heresy. It teaches that God determined who would be saved to go to heaven and who would be unsaved to go to hell. So they say in predetermination that God chose your dad to go to hell, but your mother to go to heaven. And there's nothing you can do in this life to get your your dad saved because he's going to hell because God determined he's going to hell. And there's nothing you can change that your mother is saved because God determined for her to be saved. But however, you got saved and now your baby brother, God determined for him to go to hell. You see, that's demonic. That is not a true doctrine of the Bible anywhere. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches whosoever will. The will was not God willing. It's man accepting Christ as Lord and Savior. The will is on man's part, not God's part. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth. So it's not God that's saying you can't believe and you can believe. That's heresy. That's why I call it a damnable doctrine. So that's not the interpretation of this word we are discovering here, predestination. Now, the word predestination is actually understood when you look at what Paul interprets it as in verse 29. The image of Jesus Christ. And then he calls Jesus Christ the firstborn. So it's not the image of Jesus Christ while he was alive in his body. It's the image of Jesus Christ when he was resurrected. That's a whole different image. The image of Christ when he was the firstborn, he uses the doctrine firstborn. The firstborn means resurrected. 
So when Christ came out of the grave, what did he look like? Well, his spirit, soul, and body were saved. They were born again. They were resurrected. Well, that's what you're predestined to become. Now, let's look at the word. Pre means the future look. It's what they use whenever they want to give you a preview of a movie. Pre means a future look into that movie. So it's a preview. But when dealing with the doctrine predestination, you're getting a future look at your destiny, not a movie. Your destiny, where you are to end up in eternity. That's why the doctrine is called predestination. So now we're going to move on. Verse number 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, you've got to follow this pattern. It's very important to find out this is the pattern in order for a Christian to get his soul and body saved. This is the pattern. Those of us that are predestined are also called. Now, what is my calling? Well, you have to figure that out. You're called in Isaac? Yes. And then what else am I called for? To carry a cross. To bear fruit. You're called to obey commandments. You're called to abide in the true vine. You're called to believe the doctrines. You're called, and it just goes on and on. Your calling, if you can meet your calling, then you will arrive at the place of being justified. This is faith by works. And once you've been justified because you're obedient, you will arrive at being glorified. So this is actually a salvation by faith with works. And Paul teaches this in a lot of places, like 1 Timothy chapter number 4, verse 16, where Paul says to Timothy, if you obey the doctrine of the Ten Commandments written in the heart, you will become saved. So salvation is based on obedience to the Ten Commandments, which is faith works for salvation. 1 Timothy 4.16. And that's the doctrine he's talking about from chapter number 1 of 1 Timothy, the doctrine of the Ten Commandments. Now here, like in all the Pauline epistles, Paul writes about how to get the soul and body saved by faith with works. In all of Paul's epistles, he writes about the spirit is saved by faith without works. So we've got to make note of the contrast, the differences when he's writing about the human spirit or when he's writing about the soul and body. But we can see he's just spent an extensive amount of study on the salvation of the body how to get the body saved and he told us as far back as verse number 18 we we'll go back there to verse 19 and you keep coming all the way down this is about the salvation of the body until we reach verse 29 predestination for the salvation of the body. And here how. This is how the body gets saved. By your calling. Your justification. And then your glorification. And the glorification means the resurrection. The redemption. Of your soul and body. Now in verse number 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? So if God is for you and I, no devil, 
no power of darkness, no child of the devil, no carnal Christian, no sin, no wickedness, no witchcraft or sorcery is going to be able to separate us from God loving us or taking care of us. Paul's going to go into this extensively here. In verse 32, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I suppose we could camp here for a good week. Verse 32. If God was willing to give you his son, what wouldn't he give you? That's really the question that's being asked. You know, if you threaten a man and you say to the man, I'm going to kill you, that man is willing to give you his house, his car, his bank accounts, his gold. He's going to give you everything. He's willing to give it. But when it comes to giving his son or his daughter or his wife, those are the last things that come into his mind to sacrifice, not willing to sacrifice. And so Paul is saying, if God went as far as the hardest thing to sacrifice his son, then it's much easier for him to sacrifice his treasure, his gold, his crowns, power, authority. He's willing to give you that more easily then he was willing to give you his son. So he concludes here in verse 32. Freely give us all things. All things. Now verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Now, we have justification by faith without works and justification by faith with works. And so here, Paul is talking about it is God that justifieth. This is a faith without works. This justification, <clears throat> the justification is, is based upon Christ being raised from the dead. That's Romans chapter 4, verse 25. So if you go back to Romans 4, 25, all Christians are justified when God gave you his son and he rose from the dead, you were justified. <clears throat> In verse 34, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So remember, our justification is based on his resurrection, and we believed it. And now, because he's resurrected, he's interceding as our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. In verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Is there anything in this life that can separate us? from Christ loving us? Well, ultimately, the question is rhetorical. There's nothing that can separate us. In verse 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Have you ever felt like that? that you're a sheep and people are slaughtering you. Because that's what happens to a lot of sheep. They're counted as sheep for the slaughter. 
But what about when you have to take up a cross daily and you have to crucify yourself? Or when you have to obey the commandment that Paul said, mortify your body. Mortify means kill off the desires of the body, kill them off. So you're a sheep led to the slaughter daily. Verse 37. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now this expression, more than a conqueror, goes back to when Jesus Christ died on the cross. He conquered sin. He conquered death. He conquered Satan. He conquered hell. He conquered the grave. And then he gave us the victory and said, you are more than the conqueror because we didn't even fight. He fought, he conquered, and he gave us the victory. So we're more than the conqueror. And it's through Christ that loved us. In verse 38, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. So Paul's making this long list of things that could possibly separate us from the love of Christ and saying, even all of these things will not be able to separate you from the love of Christ. And you will notice. What he listed here, angels. I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, whether I die, whether I live, angels that are serving God or angels that are devils, they're not going to be able to separate us from God. Principalities, which means the laws of Moses. Powers, principalities can also mean what's going on in the demonic realm, the world of darkness, in all of their laws that they've set up. Things present nor things to come. So no matter what we're going to face in the future, it won't separate us from the love of Christ. In verse 39 nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. Now, thank God he included all other human beings when he said any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So none of these things can separate us from the love of God. Now, We've extensively had to elaborate on Romans 8 because it needed full attention. Now we're going into Romans chapter 9, and we're going to look at an allegory, although it's not called an allegory. But yet it is an allegory because Paul taught us what an allegory was in Galatians chapter 4. An allegory is when you use more than two or three shadows and typologies. And those shadows and typologies become the allegory. So the allegory is joining together three, four, five, six shadows and typologies. You're joining the shadows and typologies together. And when you do, you create the allegory. And this is what chapter 9 is going to do for us. It's going to create an allegory. So I'm going to view chapter 9 a little differently. I'm going to deal with it a little differently. I went through chapter 8 verse by verse, and I expounded. Now I'm going to read chapter 9, verses 1. And I'm going to go all the way down to verse 13. Okay, I'm going to do this a little different. Because I'm looking for the allegory. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. 
that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Whose are the fathers? And of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham, are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is... They which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise, at this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, and by our father Isaac. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Now I'm going to circle verse number 14, because next week we're going to continue in verse 14. So what did Paul just say here? This is huge theology. I really need hours to interpret it, hours. But I'm going to give you a nutshell of information because of time. In verse number four, the apostle is talking about the Jewish nation Israel. And he said to them pertain the adoption, they should have been the children of God. Now I use it lightly, should have been. And today they are not the children of God. But it was given to them first to become a child of God. The glory was given to them and the covenants are plural. Now they received the Ten Commandments in stone as a covenant. That's Deuteronomy 5 verse 2 and 3. That was a covenant of the Ten Commandments in stone. And they received the Davidical covenant in 2 Samuel 7. Verse number 12 and 13. Those are the covenants pluralized. The giving of the law has to do with the Ten Commandments. Now the law is the moral law. And the service of God, that's the tabernacle. And the promises. So they had conditional promises as well as unconditional promises. Now as you read on you start to read that the children Israel, which were the children of God, are no longer the children of God. And you may not believe that. You may not believe what Paul is teaching here because of your upbringing in some of these Christian churches where they're going to defend Israel till their last breath. Believing that if you bless them, God will bless you, which is heresy. It's not true. God is going to tell you through the Apostle Paul, and this is why all Messianic, so these are born-again Jews, disrespect the Apostle Paul. They disrespect him. And they only call him Rabbi Paul. They want to lower his apostleship and make him just another rabbi. They totally disrespect him. I've seen it too many times in messianic churches because Paul put down Israel and said they are not the children of God. Now listen to this in verse number six. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. 
So all of these people that are Jewish because they think they have a bloodline are not actual Jews. And that's a slap in the face to Israel, no doubt. And verse number seven, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they the children of Abraham. So the Jews want to claim we're the children of Abraham. And if you bless Abraham's seed, God will bless you. But it's not them. They're not the children of Abraham. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That means Christianity is the children of Abraham. And that's down in Galatians 3.29. Paul says we are the seed of Abraham. And we are the ones that people need to bless in order for God to bless them. And now look at verse number eight. That is, they which are the children of the flesh. Now that's Israel. It's called the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God. Do you believe what Paul just said here? Israel are not the children of God. Because they're the child of the flesh. They're not the children of God. But the children of the promise, that's Christianity, are counted for the seed. We're the children of God, not Israel. Now, he's going to go into an allegory to explain what he's talking about. For this is the word of promise, at this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. Verse number 10. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. Now here comes the allegory. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder. So the firstborn was Esau. Rebekah gave birth. To Esau, the older, and the older shall serve the younger. Now, this hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen in the millennium. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. God loved the younger one, hated the older one. So what is he talking about in the allegory? All right. Now, just like Galatians chapter 4, we're going to take more shadows and typologies and join them together. And whenever you join shadows and typologies together, you create an allegory. So look at what happened here. He used Isaac as God the Father. Isaac is being used as a representation of God the Father. Isaac had two children, and God would have two children. The Jews are the firstborn, and the Christians are the secondborn. They're the younger. The Jews are the older. Esau represents the firstborn, meaning the Jews in the flesh. And Jacob represents the secondborn, meaning Christians, the younger brother. Now, God said in verse 13, Jacob have I loved. God loves Christianity, and Esau have I hated. God hated Judaism. God hated it. And you may not agree with Paul or his allegory, but this is a great revelation. And I believe we need to applaud. And say, thank you, Lord. This sets me free. And you see, in our churches, beloved, many of them are running around saying, bless Israel and God will bless you. And they're lying to you. Now, that lie was created by the Jewish nation and taught to Christianity. They're lying to you. Paul made it very clear in Galatians 3.29, read it, we're the seed of Abraham. We are Jacob that God loves. 
And if you bless a Christian, God will bless you. This goes back to Abraham's covenant, Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, which is given to Christianity, not to Israel. And that is very clear in Paul's teaching. Very clear. We are the heirs of Abraham's covenant. And we must make note of it. We must comprehend it. Now, Paul's not ignoring the fact that the physical Jew had a bloodline and a fleshly connection to Abraham. He's not ignoring that. And even Jesus didn't ignore it. When the Jews were crying, we are the children of Abraham. And Jesus said in the Gospel of John, I know you're Abraham's seed, but your father is an Abraham. It's Satan. You are not the children of God. God is not your father. The devil is your father. Abraham's not your father. Oh, he is through a bloodline. Yeah, I know you're Abraham's seed, Jesus told them. So we're not being ignorant of where they came from or their genealogy record or the fact that they had a fleshly inheritance in Abraham's covenant, but the spiritual inheritance was not given to them. It was given to Christianity. Now, I could elaborate on this for hours because there's a lot to talk about, but our time is gone. We're going to turn our attention to worshiping the Lord before we go into the main service of preaching today on discipleship. That's our topic for our sermon today, discipleship. So let us turn our heart upward. And let us prepare ourselves to worship God. Oh, 
there are many songs about God that help us want to worship him. And for various reasons, because God has healed us, delivered us, God has the power to do far more exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. And so sometimes we like to sing songs like that. song because the song draws me closer to worshiping the creator of heaven and earth realizing that God is able to deliver me able to heal me able to provide to protect the Lord's able to raise me up now you see one time I was wrestling with faith I came home one night after preaching on the street I was extremely tired because the TTC stopped. I didn't have a vehicle and I had to walk a long distance. And it was two, three in the morning by the time I reached back home. And I laid on my bed and my window was open. And I said to God, Lord, would you close the window for me? I'm too tired to get up. I'm exhausted. And I prayed. And then I started to pray that God was able to do it. And look what the Lord taught me. The Lord taught me what faith was. You see, I spent about 10 more minutes lying there praying, telling God how able he was. You created this. You created that. You made this. You made that. You have the power, all power. You're able to do it. Close the window for me. But I couldn't convince God. And then I realized, wait a minute. I'm telling God that he's able to do it, but I'm not believing that he will do it. 
So I instantly changed my prayer. And I said, Father, thank you for closing the window for me. I believe you're going to close that window, Lord. Thank you. And do you know a wind came from nowhere on a very calm night and shut the window closed? Can you imagine that? That's exactly what happened. Was that a coincidence? No, that was an answer to prayer, beloved. That was a God incident. I changed my prayer from believing God is able to believing God will. Now, in my song, we sing God is able, but we want to move to what faith is. Faith is now believing God will. So when you pray, believe that he will answer you. And God will make a way for you where there's no way. God will bring down every mountain. Amen. Raise up every valley. God will deliver you and give you the victory. Well, in the name of Jesus. above every name but you know when you read it God gives you the power to remove mountains also but he placed it upon a condition the condition is you must have the seed the mustard seed faith if you have the mustard seed faith 
then you'll say to a mountain, move, and it will obey you. Now, what is the mustard seed faith? That's the harder question. Well, I guess only one man in the Bible actually revealed what it was, and he was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. And Jesus said, I've never found so great faith, not even in Israel. The mustard seed faith. Listen to how the man described it. He said to Jesus, you don't need to come to my house to pray for my servant. Just speak the word. Because I am a man under authority. And I say to my servants, do this and do that. And they do it. And I say to one, come, and he comes, and to another, go, and he goes. That's the mustard seed faith. When you become under authority to God, and then you use the power of God in order to tell diseases to die, people to be healed, people to raise from the dead, you come under authority, so you're given authority. That's the mustard seed faith, the secret to it. You think about that, beloved. Not by not might nor by power, a mountain can come down with a mustard seed faith. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, I heard an old, old story about a I'm <laughs> 
Jesus. The old time hymns, some of them are so lovely and they carry weighty, weighty messages. Like on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. Weighty messages are found within a lot of those old hymns. We thank God for them. Not that we shouldn't be singing the new ones as well, because the commandment out of Ephesians said, to sing even new songs, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. And so we want to do that as well. well. That's Colossians. We want to bless God for our time here to be able to sing of the goodness of God. Amen. We're going to end with one last song. Going back into our Bible to Psalms number 61. If you have a Bible, maybe you can open up with me. Psalms number 61. Hear my cry, oh God, and Higher than I. 
somewhere to go. Lamb, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Beloved, we're going to look today on the topic of discipleship. In the church today, you're going to find out a difference between believers and disciples. There may be 50% believers and 50% disciples. And I might look at it like the foolish and wise virgins, five wise and five foolish. And so we're going to talk about disciple. What makes a believer a disciple? What is the difference? How does a disciple actually become a disciple? Why aren't they a believer? And why have they moved into the category of discipleship and not just a believer? See, when you get born again, you're only a believer. You believe in Jesus Christ and you're not a disciple. Discipleship is maturity. A lot of Christians go from earth to glory without ever becoming a disciple. Sad to say. But God's will is for every Christian to become a disciple and not just to stay a believer. Now, there are many benefits attached to being a disciple, many rewards. Much treasure is given to disciples. Knowledge is given to disciples. Mysteries and secrets are given to disciples. Work is given to disciples. Labor to disciples. Suffering is given to disciples. Rewards are given to disciples. Treasure is given to disciples. Crowns and glory are given to disciples. So when we talk about ultimately who is going to rule and reign, it's the disciples. You think it would behoove us to become a disciple. You think that in all churches, this would be priority number one. Become a disciple. And it should be. Because we need discipline. Amen. Our spirit doesn't need discipline. It's our soul and body that does. It needs to be disciplined. Not our spirit. Our spirit is circumcised. It doesn't need to be disciplined. It's born again already. It's already saved. Our spirit is ready to be a disciple from the moment we accept Christ. But we've got to grow into becoming a disciple. We can only do that through maturity, beloved. And as we study discipleship today, I'm sure you're going to agree with me. There's not a lot of people becoming disciples. And I'm sure you're going to start to see the difference between Christians that are only believers and Christians that are disciples. Now, for you and I, we need to make ourselves a disciple. We need to already have that thought in our heart. Lord, I'm going to become a disciple. See, the disciple is willing to obey the commandments of God. The believer is not. Whenever believers decide, I'm not going to obey the commandments of God, 
they make themselves haters of God, although they believe in him. But they're haters because they will not submit to God. They will not submit. Now, in the end, they're going to be called wicked and slothful servants. There's no good end for a believer that did not become a disciple. There's no good end. So we want to make sure that we are not on that path to destruction, the broad road, where many believers are there today, on the broad road. We want to get off that road and get onto the narrow road that makes us a disciple and brings us to eternal life for the soul and body. Now, only the path of disciples will lead to eternal life for the soul and body. We need that, not to mention all the treasure that God has stored up for those who become disciples. We're going to find out today many thoughts that the Bible has, Christ has himself, many thoughts on disciples. Do you know that to become an apostle, you first must be a disciple? Did you know that? You need to be a disciple before you become an apostle. And that's the highest calling there is in the body of Christ, to be an apostle. But you cannot attain that high calling of apostleship if you haven't attained discipleship. So let's begin. We are not going chronologically, book by book, from Matthew and so forth. We're not doing that. Sporadically, we're just going to go through the Bible and look at some sayings on disciples. We want to glean certain knowledges. You would be wise at this point to get a paper and pen. You would be very wise to write down some of this knowledge that you're going to hear so that you can go back over it and make your decision about being a disciple. There are things that are required of all disciples. They're required. You cannot get away from it. And so being a disciple is not an easy road, but it is a rewarding road. It's very rewarding. But it may not be easy. The broad road and the easy road leads to destruction. We don't want that. We want the narrow road that leads to eternal life, which is a harder road. Now, I'm going to be going to many chapter verses today. We're teaching, not preaching today. So because we're teaching we're going to use maybe 30 chapter verses, maybe 40. Depends how long time allows us. And we're going to look into the understanding of discipleship. Let's go to the Gospel of Luke. We're going to begin in Luke 14 here. No rhythm or rhyme to what we're doing. So don't look for me to be going chronologically. I am not. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verse number 33. So likewise, Whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Now this is a condition in order to become a disciple. You have to be willing to forsake all that you have. So let's look at the list. I have a father, a mother, a wife, or a husband, children friends, 
neighbors a job. I have money. I have a home, bank account, and so forth. The question is, are you willing to forsake it all in order to become a disciple? Now listen to how this works. The young man gets saved on a Friday night, comes home, tells his parents, I just gave my heart to Jesus Christ. Well, they're not excited. They're telling him, you're not allowed to go out to any church or any meetings. So what does he do? Does he disobey his parents for his new faith? Or does he obey his parents? Jesus said, you've got to be willing to forsake all. He's got to disobey his parents and run for salvation. Run from the wrath of God to the salvation of God. We're looking at forsaking all right now. Now, there are people that gain money by very wicked means. And they put their hand to something that is sinful in order to get profit. Are you willing to forsake that sinful job in order to get the salvation and become a disciple? You have to be willing to forsake all. God is not asking you to forsake things that will profit you to serve him, but things that hinder you from serving him. That's what he's asking you to forsake. So it could involve your job, because maybe you're a car salesman. Maybe you're a lawyer. And everybody knows that a lawyer is a liar. Every lawyer is a liar. You cannot meet a lawyer that doesn't lie. So he earns his money like the car salesman. Nothing wrong with this car, and he knows the car is a terrible wreck. But that's how he earns his money. But now he wants to be a disciple and not allowed to lie anymore. you got to be willing to forsake all. So forsaking all touches many aspects of our life. And sometimes it can go as far as marriages and children. Now, I can tell you from experience that you can be put to the test that you either give up Christianity in order to save your marriage or you give up your marriage in order to become a disciple. I've been in that box. You better know what you're doing. You've got to know that you're willing to forsake all. I've been in the place where I've been told, if you're going to work, then you stay here and work. But if you're going to go preach, then leave. And I did. I left the job. You have to know what you're forsaking. Nothing can go before God. And all those that God wants you to actually give up are only sinful things anyway. Now, if you're not willing to do it, you cannot be his disciple. So that's clear from the very beginning of discipleship. If you're going to become a disciple, you have to make up in your heart, from your heart, not your soul. Your soul won't do it. Your soul will give you every reason not to do this. Only your spirit will do it. So you make a decision in your heart. Doesn't matter. No matter what the price. If Christ can pay it all, I'll pay everything too. I'm going to be a disciple. You have to have that determination and decision made up. Now look at Luke 14. And verse number 26 and 27. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot, cannot be my disciple. 
and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Well, here are very serious words from the Lord indeed. Many Christians have to wrestle this. You must wrestle with this. Do you really want to become a disciple? Then why does this look like a contradiction? In the commandments of God, he said, honor your father and mother. Love them. Now he's telling me, in discipleship, hate them. What's going on here? Now, God never means that you are to physically hate your mother and father. He doesn't mean that. He says it, but you need to interpret it. If your father and mother are stopping you from serving God, hindering you from becoming a disciple, you have to choose God above your parents, which results in hating them. That's what's going to happen because you're not going to obey them. Because if you obey them, it means you love them. But now to become Christ's disciple and to love God, you can't love them because they're telling you don't serve God, don't read a Bible, don't pray, don't believe in Jesus. You can't do it. Now you've got to hate them and love God. Now it doesn't mean that I'm hating my father and mother. I don't want to be around them. I don't want to see them anymore. It doesn't mean that. It means with sorrow, tremendous sorrow in your heart because you love them. But now you can't obey them. And that disobedience is a form of hatred. And the same thing is said about a man's wife or his own children. If they are stopping you, hindering you from serving the Lord, better for you to serve the Lord. Not serve them. Serve the Lord. Because they're stopping you from serving the Lord. Even your own life is in question here. Do you want your soul to live so that you forfeit eternal life for your soul and body? Do you want to live now and enjoy the pleasure of sin? There is pleasure to sin. But it always comes with the wages of the sin, which is death. Nobody wants the, the death. They don't want to enjoy death because you can't enjoy death. Death is a torment. They want to enjoy the pleasure to sin, but they don't want the wage that comes after, which is death. So Christ said, if you're not willing to take up a cross, deny yourself, you can't be a disciple. Are you finding the high price already? Well, it comes with a lot of rewards. We're going to talk about all of it. We're going to talk about the benefits of being a disciple too. But right out of the gate, from the very beginning, I've given you the hardship of it right away. This is the price you've got to pay to become a disciple. Now, Luke chapter 6. Verse number 40. The disciple is not above his master. But everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Now you will never figure this out all the days of your life, what the meaning of this is, when you use your soul. When you're trying to think about the meaning of this from your soul, you'll never figure it out. Only your spirit man can discern what this means. The disciple is not above his master. Now, who is the master of all Christianity? The Lord Jesus Christ. 
and the disciple is not above the master. So what does it mean? Your soul will never give you the interpretation of that. You've got to go to your spirit, your inner man. And with that, you need an anointing from God in order to find out the meaning of that. I'm going to tell you what the meaning of it is, but I never knew it for maybe, maybe 15 or 20 years. What does it mean to be above your master Jesus or to be like him? What does it mean? One thing it does not mean is that I can be like Christ to have as much power as he had or as much knowledge as he had or as much anointing as he had. That's not what it's talking about. I can cast out as many devils as he did or do as many miracles as he did. That's not what it's talking about. The disciple is not above his master in suffering. Now listen to me carefully. You compare this to our pastors today. Compare it. And you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. We're going to read today a portion of scripture where Jesus said, The foxes have Holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't have anywhere to lay his head. You know that Jesus walked maybe 40 or 50 miles to go from one place to another. He walked, walked outside. You know where he slept? Outside. He didn't have any, any bed to sleep on, no roof over his head. Now, look at our modern day pastor. You ask the man to come and preach for you. You know what he says to you? I need a five star hotel. Pick me up in a Rolls Royce, a Mercedes. Make sure that somebody is there. And before I come, I want you to put thousands in my bank account before I come and preach. You know what that is? That's not discipleship. These are people that are above the master. They're not going to the level of Christ of suffering. They're avoiding suffering, avoiding it, and exalting themselves. And Christ said, the disciple is not above the master. Do not exalt yourself above what Jesus suffered. If he walked, you don't need a jet. You don't need your own airplane. If Jesus walked and rode a donkey, you don't need these fancy cars that you collect as items. You know why you're above your master? You're not a disciple. You're a believer. But you're showing the world you're not a disciple. I'd love to preach that to some of these so-called preachers of the gospel of prosperity. They're all above the master, every one of them. Now, in Matthew chapter 10, in verse number 24 and 25, Again, we read, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? So what is Jesus talking about? Suffering like he did. Expect it. If they're calling Jesus a devil, do you think that you should be called 
oh, you're such a wonderful servant of God and everybody should think well of you and they're calling your master a devil? You're looking for praise and look at what they did to him. Don't become above your master. You're expecting people to exalt you and honor you. Don't get like that. You're far from Christ. Far. They persecuted him. They called him a devil. They called him a gluttonous man. They called him a wine bibber. That's what they called Christ. Expect it. They call you a cult. They call you an evil person. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm not above my master. I expect it. That's fine. Go ahead. Persecute me. That's to be expected. Look at Acts 9.36 with me. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. Are you getting a little glimpse into what a disciple does? They have a lot of good works. Alms deeds means alms is when you're giving something for free to people that you own could be money for Dorcas. She took her money, she made clothing and went to people that didn't have clothing and she gave clothing to people as her arms, people that were poor and didn't have any clothing. So Dorcas, Tabitha would spend her time creating clothing and then go out on the street and give it as alms. She was full of good deeds. That's a disciple of Christ. Let's look at Matthew 10, 42. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple. So we're dealing with disciples and now you're giving a disciple a drink of cold water. Verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. So he's going to get a reward for giving a drink of cold water to a disciple. Now what does it mean? Many people think, first of all, that this means literal water and a glass of water they're going to give to a disciple so that they do not lose any reward that they'll get for giving the water. But let me take you deeper into thought. Jesus said, one of these little ones, look at what he called the disciple, a little one. Now, in order for a disciple to become a little one, you have to empty yourself out. You have to become like a child, where you don't do your will, you do your father's will. You're like a child. Christ said, unless you become converted and become like one of these little ones. Children ask their parents permission to do things. That's what you've got to be. You empty yourself out. You don't become an adult in God's kingdom. You stay a little one. And as a little one, a disciple, that's a little one. Someone gives you a drink of cold water. We may be talking about physical water or we may be talking about doctrine, commandments, unconditional promises, conditional promises, prophecy. 
the word of God from the New Testament, which is water, that you're sharing with a little one, a disciple. Let's move on from that thought. John chapter 19. In John 19, verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave and came therefore and took the body of Jesus. Now, beloved, it's not always possible that people can know that you're a disciple. Joseph was a disciple of Christ secretly. You know, it's very dangerous to be a disciple of Christ in China, in North Korea. They're going to throw you in jail. They're going to kill you. You've got to know that in some places... You're a disciple of Christ secretly. And this is going to happen in very dangerous places around the world. And so it doesn't mean you're giving up discipleship. It's just not open to the world. You're still a disciple of Christ. Now in Luke chapter 11... And in verse number 1, Luke 11, verse 1. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. As a disciple, you're going to ask the Lord to teach you many things. Prayer is one of those things. Disciples are dependent upon Christ. They need the Lord to instruct them and to teach them. They need the Lord to inspire them, to give them power. They need the Lord to, to help them, direct them. And so they're looking for Christ always. They're looking unto the Lord continually as disciples. Teach us how to pray. In Matthew 15, going back to Matthew chapter 15, verse number 36. And he took the seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks and break them and gave to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. Now, look at this. In the literal story, Christ gave the meat and the loaves to the disciples. He did not give it to the people. It was the disciples that went to the people to distribute the loaves and the meat. What am I saying? You know, King Solomon, he wrote many proverbs. King Solomon said, Consider the ant, thou sluggard. Consider the ant. Have you ever considered an ant? You know what an ant does? An adult ant will take food. And it starts to crunch up all that food in its mouth. And after it crunches all, all that food, it goes to the baby ant, and then it puts that food in the mouth of the baby ant. What am I saying? To the disciple, God is going to give meat, and he's going to give the word of God as bread. This is far greater than water and milk. Water and milk belong to the believer. 
I'm talking about the easy things of God's word. But meat and bread go to the disciple. Now, it's up to the disciple to take a loaf of bread and break it in smaller pieces so that somebody else can eat. They can't eat the loaf. It's too much information. It's too much knowledge. But the disciple is taught heavy things from the word of God that are called meat. Weighty things from the word of God. It's very difficult to give it to anyone and everyone. So the meat and the bread goes first to the disciple and the disciple then gives it to the multitude. Again, I'm looking at Luke chapter 8, verse number 9 and 10. As I said, there's no rhythm or rhyme to our study today. Luke chapter 8 and verse number 10. I'm going to read verse 9 before I read verse 10. Okay, Luke 8. Let's read verse 9 and then verse 10. And his disciples asked him, saying, what might this parable be? So who's asking the interpretation of the parable? The disciple. Now look at verse 10. He said, unto you... Unto who? Unto disciples. It is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to others in parables, that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. Listen to this conditional promise. Carefully. Listen to this. Seriously. Only when you become a disciple will God share mysteries and secrets with you. Mysteries about his kingdom and secrets about his kingdom are only given to disciples. They're not given to believers. Just because you became a child of God, you're a believer, you believe in Jesus Christ, God is not going to share with you his secrets, and his mysteries about his kingdom. The disciples asked him the meaning, and he said, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. The secrets of the kingdom are for disciples. Now, many years ago, when God opened my spirit to kingdom theology, and I understood the three manifestations and the three dispensations of the kingdom of heaven. I understood the three names of this kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ. And I understood the laws of the kingdom. When I mentioned it to a doctor, a doctor of a Bible college, he didn't know what I was talking about. What are you talking about? No idea. As a doctor of a Bible college, you don't know what I'm saying. Huge question mark in my mind. You're a doctor and you don't know what I'm talking about. So I've got to go back now. I've talked to pastors that didn't know what I was talking about. I've talked to all kinds of brethren that didn't know what I'm talking about. Whenever I talk about the mysteries, and the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, lo and behold, they don't know. Why don't they know? Because if they were disciples, Christ said it's given to disciples to know. You have to realize that, beloved. 
And it takes time to grow as, as a disciple, to learn things as well. Now, it doesn't mean as soon as you make up your mind to become a disciple, your head gets full of all this knowledge. It doesn't work like that. If you're a disciple, it means you're reading your Bible daily. You're meditating on the Bible daily, like disciples do. They're involved in things of the kingdom daily. Disciples are like that. Pastor Downey sings a song, when you see me walking, I got Jesus on my mind. When you see me talking, a conversation, I got Jesus on my mind. Disciples are like that. You want to call them a fanatic or a radical, but that's how they are. And we grow in knowledge. It's called growing from glory to glory. That means knowledge to knowledge. So we're going to grow in knowledge. And eventually, if you remain a disciple and keep growing as a disciple, God will share with you. It's a guarantee. He will share with you the mysteries of the kingdom of God. That's one of the benefits about being a disciple. God is going to tell you things he can't share with anyone. Now look at Matthew chapter 8 and verse number 20 to 23. Matthew 8. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, let the dead bury their dead. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. Now, do you see what disciples do? They follow Christ. That's what disciples do. They're following Christ. You will notice Jesus made a proclamation about suffering. I don't have anywhere to lay my head. I don't have a home. I don't have anything. I'm sleeping outside and the rock is my pillow. The grass is my covering. I don't have anything. And this is what it means that the servant is not above the master. Unlike our modern day preachers, which I'm ashamed to say. And they boast that I've got my own jet. You sure do. So far above the master, you sure do have your own jet. You got your own Mercedes and your own Rolls Royce. You're so wonderful. Above the master. But we need to become disciples. That's what's needful. Don't go above the master. Now, we're going to look at some conditions one more time about becoming a disciple. Found in John 13. Let's go back to John 13. Verse 34 and 35. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading John 12. I'm in the wrong place. John 13, 34 to 35. My mistake. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that's the condition, if you love one another. 
So for us to prove that we're disciples, we have to love one another, one another Christians. But look at what he said in his condition. As I have loved you. That's far greater than loving one another. Because Christ included the sacrificial love. His love was a self-denial, sacrificing, sacrificial love. That's what he's talking about. By that shall all men know you're my disciple. Again, in John chapter 8, verse 31 to 32. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So notice the difference here. It's very clear. Disciple. See the difference? We don't need believers as much as we need disciples. Disciples are those that continue in the word, and not all Christians do. And as you're continuing in the word, you're going to know the truth because you're going to start to believe it and then obey it. And by knowing that truth, that truth is going to make you free. What is it making you free from? It's going to make you free from bondage, from sin, from carnality. From the wages of sin, which is death, from darkness, it's going to make you free from lies, things that you've been told all your life that you find out, oh, that was a lie, a deception. It's going to make you free from all types of things that are carnal. That's what it means to be a disciple. You're constantly being made free. Being made free is what is known as a process. This is far different than the prophecy whom the Son sets free. Christ set you free in an instant when you believe he died on the cross for your sin. He set you free. That's not what we're talking about now. We're not talking about an instant miracle of being set free. We're talking about being made free, a process, by knowing truth as a disciple. That's one of the blessings of being a disciple. You are constantly being made free. That's one of the blessings of being a disciple. And again, in John 15. We don't want to leave John without stating John 15, verse number 8. After the wonderful message of Jesus and the true vine parable. In verse number 8. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Bearing fruit. Reveals you're a disciple of Christ. Bearing fruit. Now there's five different fruit that we're to bear. We have the fruit of the Holy Ghost. But this whole parable in John 15 is the fruit of the true vine. That's far different than the fruit of the Holy Ghost. The fruit of the kingdom of heaven. That's different as well. The fruit of a good tree. And the fruit of our lips giving thanks. Five fruit. Five different ways to bear fruit. We're talking about the fruit of the true vine. In order for people to know you're a disciple. Now Jesus is the true vine. But Jesus is according to John 1.1 1, 1, the word. And when you obey the word. Practice the word. And people see your good works. You're obeying the word. You're bearing the fruit of the true vine. So that is faith with works to bear fruit from the true vine. Now, in Matthew 26, verse 1 and 2. 
Let's go back to Matthew. And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Now, what did you just notice here? Jesus gave prophecy only to disciples. Jesus gave information, revelation, but he did it only to the disciple. He doesn't do it to the world. And he doesn't do it to Christians that are just believers. But to disciples, he will tell them prophetic things. Things that are coming to pass in the future to disciples, God reveals to them. See the blessing of discipleship, beloved? Again, in John 6, verse 60, and verse 61. Now, Jesus preaches the hardest sermon he's ever preached in his whole ministry in John chapter 6. And that sermon is, he is the bread of life, and you've got to eat his flesh and drink his blood. One of the hardest sermons he's ever preached. It was so disturbing to a Jew. Because in the book of Leviticus, under the law of Moses, the Jews knew you cannot eat meat that is raw with blood. You're forbidden to do it. And here's Jesus saying, drink my blood and eat my flesh. Totally offensive. That is completely sinful. Their conscience is beyond comprehension right now. Their conscience is so pricked badly from that sermon. But look at chapter 6, verse 60 and 61. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured, they murmured at it. He said unto them, Doth this offend you? See, disciples can get offended by what Jesus teaches. They definitely can get offended. And this is one of those cases where they did get offended. They couldn't understand. Now, as a disciple, it doesn't mean that you're going to understand everything. Although God gives you revelation, although God gives you knowledge in the mysteries about his kingdom, it doesn't mean as a disciple you're going to understand everything. Jesus has things to teach that you don't know anything about. And now look down farther to what happened to the disciples in John chapter 6, verse 66. Now, if I were superstitious, you have here the number of the beast, 666. John 6, verse 66. Notice what it says. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. What a terrible verse that is. From something that looks demonic. 666. His disciples turned around and walked away from him because of that hard saying. They left him. No matter what Christ teaches, beloved, we should never follow that as an example as a disciple. My question to you when the disciples walked away from Christ, were they no longer disciples or did they die as disciples? 
Now, you might not have the right answer, but I'm going to give you the answer based upon Luke 15. They died as disciples. Even if they never returned to follow the Lord, they still died as a disciple. Just like the sheep remains a sheep when it goes astray, the coin remains a coin when it's gone astray, and the Son of God remains a Son of God when he's down in the pig pen and gone astray. Still, the disciple remains a disciple. Now, in Matthew chapter 15 and verse number 33, we're going to deal with some questions here. Matthew 15, verse 33. And his disciples say to him, when should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? As a disciple, God is going to ask you to do things that you will not know how to get it done. How can I possibly do what God wants me to do? And you're going to ask the question to God. Lord, how can I obey that? How can I do that? Disciples have that right to ask God questions. They have that right. And again, in Matthew 17, 10, notice this. And his disciples asked him, saying, why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? Now, disciples do not know all prophecy. They didn't know about Elijah coming, which is the Greek word for Elias, but in the Hebrew, Elijah. They couldn't understand the prophecy. Why do the scriptures teach, or they say the scriptures teach before Messiah comes, Elias, Elijah has to show up. So disciples don't know all prophecy. And so they've got to ask the master. And it's good as a disciple to ask the master. That's where disciples are supposed to go. Ask the master. Our problem many times is asking one another. And if you're going to ask one another, you may end up with the same ignorance that the other disciple has. Because they don't know either. That's the problem with asking one another. Only when a disciple gets a revelation can they share the answer. Because they've spent time with Jesus. Now moving on from there. In Luke chapter 9. In verse number 40. Here's a man that had a demon-possessed son. And he comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says to the Lord, I besought thy disciples to cast him out. And they could not. The disciples could not cast out the devil. Now, as a disciple, does it mean you're going to have power to cast out devils? Not necessarily. Although it's given to you, although you could have it if you wanted it, it's a free gift to anyone, and it's under a condition of thirsting, desiring it. In John 7, verse 37 and 39, that power is there for all disciples. It's for anyone. All believers can receive it as well. But... The disciples were already casting out devils and couldn't figure out, why can't we cast out this one? The reality was, Jesus told them they had little faith. And this type of devil doesn't come out without prayer and fasting. And you will notice the chronological order. He put the prayer before the fasting. And let me tell you the secret of the meaning of that. 
Many people want to fast in order to get power. And they don't realize Jesus is saying, when you are praying, you're trying to cast out a devil. At that time, you must fast. What do you mean, Lord? Am I supposed to pray to cast out a devil and then stop eating food? No. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about when you're casting out a devil, you've got to fast from all doubt that that devil is going to stay there. You've got to fast that doubt, and you've got to believe it's coming out. It's coming out. I command it to come out. It's going to come out. That's the fasting. And it happens after the prayer. They were lacking. They were looking at the boy after they commanded the devil to come out, and they saw that the devil was still in there, and they lost their faith. And the devil didn't come out because they didn't fight. The fast was the fight. You don't look with your natural eye. We walk by faith at this point, not by sight. Not by sight. That devil's got to come out. Don't worry about what's going on, what you see with your eye. Don't think about it. The devil's got to come out. It's going to come out. That's why the Bible says in the book of Acts, when Paul cast the devil out of that woman, said it came out the same hour. Didn't say it come out right away. It came out the same hour. Now, sometimes they come out right away. I've seen them come out right away. But sometimes it may come out the same hour. Now let's go back to John chapter 20 and verse number 30. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. I love that statement from John. Jesus did a lot of things that the Bible doesn't even mention. Do you realize that? There's a lot of miracles that Christ did in the presence of his disciples. It's not in this book. I love that statement. You know why? Because it says Jesus did those miracles in the presence of his disciples. That's why I love it also. As a disciple, God will do things in front of you that he will not do in front of believers. You know how many people are longing to see God do something, anything, just to prove that he's alive? They're longing to see it. But disciples, God repeatedly does things in front of them. Isn't that wonderful? I think that's wonderful. Let's go to Acts 21. The book of Acts chapter 21. And we're looking at verse number 4. This is a very troublesome statement. I must state that. This is very troublesome. In Acts 21, verse 4, And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days. We said to Paul, through the Spirit, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. This is very troublesome. The Apostle Paul was my hero of the Bible. Next to Christ, no man like Paul. No man suffered like Paul, obeyed God like Paul, gave more than Paul. No man had greater revelation or knowledge than Paul. Paul is my absolute hero next to Christ of the Bible. 
But one thing, Paul is a disciple. He's an apostle, but he's a disciple. And you want to know that there were brethren that Paul found, these brethren, and they said to Paul, by the Spirit, that means this is a rhema prophecy. This is coming directly from God. Do not go to Jerusalem. And Paul rebelled. Paul did not listen to them. And you know what it cost Paul? His ministry and his life. He lost his life because he didn't listen to those disciples. It's a terrible outcome of what happened to Paul because he did not listen to those disciples. They weren't speaking on their own. It says they were speaking by the Holy Ghost. Now, beloved, a disciple of God may not hold an office as a bishop, a pastor, a missionary, a deacon. But that disciple doesn't mean he can't hear the voice of God. He's a disciple. He can hear the voice of God, especially when he matures. May not be in the ministry. But the disciples said to Paul, do not go to Jerusalem. And he rebelled. And he lost his ministry and his life. So disciples can hear the voice of God. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, not my lambs. Not my lambs, not believers. Those are lambs. But when they mature to become a disciple, a sheep, to hear his voice. Very troublesome, very, very troublesome scripture. Now in Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, verse 34. But without a parable, speaking not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. And you see what Jesus does with disciples? He expounds all things to them. It doesn't mean he's going to do it in a day or a month or a year. But he's going to expound all things to disciples. And I'm going to tell you now, you're going to go home and get into eternity, and Jesus will still be expounding things to you there. And as you enter the millennium, and even after the millennium, Jesus will still be expounding things to you in the new heaven and new earth. It's a non-stop situation between him and disciples, where he will continually expound things to them. So that they can grow into the image of God where they need to grow in discipleship. Now, in Matthew chapter 9, going back to Matthew chapter number 9. And in verse 37 and 38, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Disciples are commanded by God to pray to the Lord of the harvest. Are you a disciple? This is your commandment. Pray that God will send forth laborers into the harvest. That's your prayer. Now add that to your prayer list. God, send forth laborers into the harvest in the name of Jesus Christ. Pray the prayer. Add that to your prayer list. This is the will of God for disciples. 
John chapter 6 and verse number 12. And when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Now, they did it literally, but we do it spiritually. What are the fragments that we are to gather as disciples? Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. There are many fragments that make up the New Testament. Do you know out of Adam's covenant? God rejected the whole Adamic covenant from coming into the New Testament except from fragment. He took out of Adam's covenant marriage, put it in the New Testament, and he also took the rest and he brought it in the New Testament. And then Noah's covenant was completely rejected from the New Testament except for one fragment. And that was Noah was commanded to eat everything unclean and clean in Genesis chapter 9. And that's what Paul taught in 1 Timothy chapter 4. That we are to eat everything and anything, nothing to be refused. Clean, unclean, doesn't matter. The fragments need to be gathered as disciples. The whole Old Testament is rejected from coming into the New Testament. Everything about the Old Testament rejected. Except fragments. See, we're not taking anything from the Old Testament literally to obey it. But Paul took things spiritually from Leviticus 23. He took the seven feasts of Israel. And he taught the Passover, the unleavened bread, and the first fruits of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. He took fragments from Leviticus 23 in the seven feasts. He taught the feast, Passover, was the feast of harvest. The feast of trumpets is the second coming of Christ, along with the salvation of the soul and body, what he called the first resurrection. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Up the fragments. This is what Paul did. That nothing be lost. Go after the fragments. They went after the fragments. They brought it into the New Testament. Jesus did it himself in Matthew 19. And he quoted Genesis 2.24. And he brought out of the Adamic covenant marriage. These are the fragments that were brought forward. That nothing would be lost. Other than that. Adam's covenant. Noah's covenant. Everything. The Old Testament. The Ten Commandments in stone. It's all rejected. Only. What God brings into the New Testament. The Ten Commandments in the heart. The magnified law. And so forth. What a wonderful God. Now look at Luke chapter 6. Verse number 13. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. So do you see this? You have to become a disciple before God can elevate you to a high ministry like an apostle. How long will you remain a disciple before God elevates you in the ministry? We don't know that. That's going to depend upon your submission as a disciple. And when God thinks you're ready for him to thrust you into ministry. That's going to depend upon your love for God. We're almost done. Acts chapter 15 is very disturbing. 
Back in the book of Acts, chapter 15, verse number 10. You know that they wanted to bring all Christianity, the Gentile churches that Paul raised up, under the laws of Moses, 613 laws, along with the Ten Commandments in stone. They wanted Christians to obey all of that. What a mess. Jesus said, never put old wine. Don't do it into a new bottle. Don't do it. That old wine is the Old Testament. Don't do it. But they wanted to do it. And in Acts chapter 15, verse 10, listen to what Peter said. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples? The neck of the disciples, not just the believers, the disciples, which neither we, neither our fathers, nor we were able to bear. Why are you going to tell these Christians that are disciples to obey the Ten Commandments in stone and the law of Moses? Don't do it. You're tempting God. Now, our churches today, they don't care. Those churches I'm referring to that don't care are the ones that teach obedience to the Ten Commandments in stone and obedience to the laws of Moses. They absolutely do not care that they're tempting God and that they're putting a yoke, a bondage on the neck of the disciples of Christ. They don't care. Because they're building their organization. They're building their denomination. And they think they're going to present it to God when he comes back. Look at what we did for you. And God's going to burn the whole thing as wood, hay, and stubble. Well, I'm prophesying to you. In Luke chapter 6. In verse number 20. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Look at the blessing disciples receive. Because you're a disciple, you get the kingdom of God. What a powerful blessing. Because you made yourself a disciple. You're going to get God's kingdom, the millennial kingdom. And after that, the city, New Jerusalem, and the new heaven and new earth. You're going to get the kingdom of God. Because you made yourself a disciple. Yours is the kingdom of God. What a wonderful guarantee that is. Can you praise the Lord with me? We should be shouting and dancing. Lifting up holy hands. Let's look at our last chapter in verse Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 in verse 23. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches Enter into the kingdom of God. You see what Jesus says about people that are not disciples? People that have riches, that's what they're after. Fame and fortune. All right, you accomplished it. But guess what? You don't have the kingdom of God. You ran after the wrong thing. You should have been running after discipleship. You are after the wrong thing in any eternity. It's going to matter. It's going to matter. You're going to cry tears that nobody's going to wipe away. You're going to cry tears. God's only going to wipe away tears from disciples. But you, 
you're going to be crying tears because you were a believer and not a disciple. Beloved, when you add up the conclusion of the whole matter, it's far better that I learn to suffer, not go above the master, meaning I'm not telling anybody you have to pay me even one dollar to come and preach. Jesus never did, and I won't do it either. If you want to give me a love offering, praise the Lord. A workman is worthy of his hire, but I am not demanding nothing. The master never did, and I don't go above the master. You don't want to pay my plane fare for me to come and to preach to you. Don't worry about it. God will provide. I've paid my own plane fare many a time to travel the world. Down to Africa or the Caribbean in Asia to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. They didn't pay for me. I paid for myself by the grace of God because God provided. This is what Paul did because he wasn't above the master. I would rather suffer with Christ. Because it's the will of God for disciples to suffer. I would rather learn that God will share with me the mysteries and the secrets of his kingdom as a disciple. That I will follow the understanding and change from a believer to a disciple because I will forsake all. Learn to hate anything that hinders me. I will sacrifice whatever it needs so that I can follow him. Disciples follow him. So that he will share with me eternal glory. He will share with you the treasures. That you will be blessed above what you can understand or think or even imagine. God will give you far more exceedingly above all of it when you learn to be a disciple. The road may not be easy because it's a narrow road, but it's worthy of a sacrifice for the disciples of God. Now next week, we're going to have the Passover. Pastor Downey wanted me to remind you, next week we're having the Passover. I'm just catching some of these thoughts here. So a, a will of God in 1 Timothy 2.4. Leona says love. And again, praise God, the four gospels plus acts, much to learn. Amen. We thank God for you, brethren, and that God can ever help us, train us, teach us, instruct us, correct us with all long suffering, rebuking, exhorting, helping us to continue in the faith when we fall to pick us up, encourage us. We're going to go on. We're going to try. And obtain the salvation of our soul and body. And we're going to put that as a prize set before our eyes. As we learn to be discipled from earth to glory. Till we leave this corruptible. And look for our hope of incorruption. And the Lord ever increase you in wisdom, knowledge and understanding. In the gospel, the New Testament. The gospel of the kingdom. In the new covenant. Stay blessed beloved. Christ Jesus name. Amen and amen.